Welcome to the Wichita Sedgwick County Historical Museum's Senior Wednesday program. This month it's Art Deco on the Plains, a uh, program based on our exhibition uh, of the same name uh, that will be running uh, throughout the year. Uh, we look forward to our Senior Wednesday programs every fourth Wednesday through October. Consult our website, wichitahistory.org, for the latest information. Today's program is on view in the museum's auditorium and will be followed by a tour of the exhibit. Our past programs can be found on Facebook and YouTube at Wichita History, one word. Thanks to the Museum's Senior Wednesday sponsors, the Trust Company of Kansas, and Mickey Armstrong, who've given generously to make these programs possible. We also thank the museum's members for their annual support and all of our volunteers, especially the WEMS organization, for their support of the museum's gift shop. I want to uh, include, not last but not least, the City of Wichita and the Sedgwick County Board of Commissioners for the years of investment in the museum through operational support. Well, I'll begin today's program and then turn it over to our curator of collections, Jamie Fraser Tracy. But um, in considering Art Deco, we hear the term Art Deco often enough, but where did it come from? I'll try to explain more about this style and its origins following a simple timeline. The modern era emerged in the 19th century with new technology that would change the world profoundly. Photography, emerging in the 1840s, was part of this. It changed visual art by providing images that artists had labored to produce. The photographer had replaced the painter in producing portraits, for example. Artists had to reconsider how to paint and what to paint in a way that could stand apart from the realism now captured through photography. Now fine artists found themselves free to explore new paths, and they did. New attitudes towards painting and new approaches developed by the 20th century. In the first decade, artists called futurists created bold modern styles never seen before, leaving the past intentionally behind. The expressionists, taking a seemingly simplified primitive perspective, for, for recreating uh, their visual imagery. And at the same time, the Cubists took a scientific and analytical approach to creating new images. Modern art was shocking and gained attention. Its newness coincided with the, a range of changes in modern life and people were becoming resigned to these radical changes. This visual change was also present in architecture and design. As exemplified by the work of Frank Lloyd Wright in the United States and with groups such as the Bauhaus, a German institution focused on the full range of the arts. The Times experienced a unique new aesthetic. This new visual world was then propagated by the rise of mass production, and new mass media that hadn't existed until this moment. This moment in time, the first decades of the 20th century, were also defined by war. The Great War, as it was known then, now referred to as World War I, was an astounding conflict involving over 30 nations and inflicted an unprecedented 40 million casualties. The emerging the emerging technologies of this time included new means of travel and communication. For example, in 1921, President Warren Harding was the first to travel to his inauguration in an automobile, then speak using a microphone. Cars rapidly replaced horses, large crowds could be addressed, and those addresses could be heard far and wide on radio. It takes a while, in this case, in the case of Art Deco, 30 or 40 years for critical assessment of history to come to light. So by 1970, the style we call Art Deco acquired an art historical context and the term Art Deco became, came into popular use. 
The Art Death Go aesthetic was not lost to us locally. Wichita was quick to embrace the times and redefine itself as a modern city. The museum's curator, Jamie Fraser Tracy, will share some examples of the local culture defining this period. What is Art Deco? The term, short for Arts Decoratifs, took its name from an exposition held in Paris in 1925. Celebrating a new style characterized by geometric decoration, symmetry, and stylized designs, Art Deco was a global phenomenon. Art Deco combined modern style with an embrace of new materials and exciting technologies. In the United States, Art Deco influenced the design of everything from skyscrapers, automobiles, and bicycles to clothing, furniture, and decorative arts, all engineered for an American lifestyle. Art Deco on the Plains, and we're actually in the exhibit now, so you can see some of the things that we have on the fourth floor, and that's what we're going to be talking about today is Art Deco on the Plains. I want to start off first, though, by giving a little bit of background. Um, and you see here a view of downtown Wichita. This is about 1923. It's looking west from the 200 block of East Douglas. And you can see the broad view there at the end of the street. And there's quite a lot of activity going on. There's cars lining the curb. There's pedestrians on the sidewalk. There's um, our version of skyscrapers, um, trolley cars, street cars, just a lot of activity. And I want to say that um, Many of you know that Wichita was founded in 1870, so in 1920 we were celebrating our Golden Jubilee, so our 50th anniversary. And we had grown from a town of 700 in 1870 to over 70,000 citizens in just 50 years. So we emerged from World War I with a spirit of optimism. Companies including Coleman, Mentholatum, Derby Oil, and later Travelair, Beach, Stearman, and Cessna ensured a vibrant business community. By the turn of the 20th century, Wichita had become a major regional commercial center, offering a wide variety of goods and services, and many of which you can see were in the shops here in this photograph. Um, and there were over a dozen department stores in the downtown area alone where people could purchase the latest fashions and home goods. Here's another photograph of downtown Wichita. And you'll notice that most of these photographs I'm showing you will be of the downtown area because that's where everything was happening at the time. Another uh, view about 1923. This is Douglas Avenue from Market. Um, and you can see the bidding building in view there at the left. That building still stands, although it lo looks markedly different. Um, that's now uh, been re remodernized in the 1950s, but still a lot of street activities. You can see that Wichita was a very bustling, bustling town. This is a view of Lawrence, of course now we know that as Broadway, looking south from the 200 block north, uh, about 1931. You'll notice on the uh, left is the Orpheum, um, Orpheum Theater, still there. Um, on the right, the REO dealership, sadly, that's gone. Ennis is a little bit further down the block, and that building still stands. Um, just another example, this, you know, now we're into the Depression era, but still quite a lot of activity downtown. This is Douglas and Emporia, about 1930. You'll notice on the right is the New Lynn Hotel. Many of us remember that as Mead's Corner. And then Henry's, uh, the, the department store, men's store, is just right next door. And we'll show a, a close-up version of that view here in a minute. And again, the broad view down at the end, kind of anchoring that, that side of Douglas. And so, I mean, you can almost hear this photograph, I think. Uh, this The cacophony of traffic sounds, the people on the street. You can see that there are women who are very smartly dressed. That's why I've kind of cropped in this photograph so you can see some of the clothing styles. Women wearing their cloche hats. The man here in the foreground, I think he's wearing a pair of overalls. It's a little hard to tell. Um, and then there's a, a young man there on the uh, median selling newspapers, probably the Eagle or the Beacon. This is the Brown Building. Um, 
It's at 105 South Broadway. That's still there. It's now it's uh, Broadway Plaza. It's across from the Crest Building and the Ambassador Hotel. The Kansas Theater is there at the uh, right-hand side of the screen. We'll show another photograph of that later. But you can see that there are some of the buildings here, some of the storefronts that have adopted that uh, Art Deco design, Lewins in particular, and then Levitt Diamonds, and then just to, you know to see how vibrant downtown was in the 20s and 30s, I think is quite fascinating. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some of these specific specific buildings. I won't get too much into the architecture. Um, if you attended the Wichita Art Museum program some weeks ago with Dean Bradley and Larry Schwarm, you can see that now on their YouTube channel. And they go into all the details about that aspect of Wichita, the architecture. So if you want to uh, explore that more, I encourage you to watch that video. This is the Wichita Art Museum. Many of you um, are familiar with this uh, organization, if not this building, because this building, while it still stands, it's been ensconced by um, recent additions. So this was a federal, federal relief work project. It was done in 1935. And this was not the only federal relief work project. Um, in 1933, Wichita received funds to convert the structure on the left, which was the central fire station, into a modern police station, which you see then on the right. Um, you can see is a very dramatic difference in architectural styles. The police or the fire station was constructed in 1906 and it was modeled to mimic the architecture of City Hall, which is the building we're in now. Kind of a rusticated limestone Romanesque style. And then a marked change from the Art Deco design of the police station. And you can see that's very evident here in these photographs. Remember we mentioned the Henry's um, Men's Store. This is a uh, night photograph, so you can see the neon in, in full display. This was at 420 East Douglas, about 1929. Henry's at this point in time was almost exclusively a men's store. It wasn't until the 1940s that they started to uh, branch out into women's wear, and then by 48 when they moved into that great store on uh, Broadway that they um, started carrying a full line of women's clothing. And that building, of course, is, is gone. Here's a great photograph. This is the Porter Block, and it's of a very uh, pedestrian, I would describe, architectural style, at least, at least the two-story building, which was um, completed in 1902. This is the 211 to 215 East Douglas. What's interesting about it um, is the two shops there on, on the first floor. Grayson Shop and Learner Shops, and we'll see a close-up view of those here. Uh, Grayson opened in August of 1933, and Learner's opened in May of 1931, so a two years difference between these two shops, and you can see the kind of a major difference in the design of the exterior um, in comparison. When Grayson opened in 33, they had an article in the newspaper that stated Grayson features one of the most unusual and attractive storefronts ever witnessed here. Chromium plated metal forms the entire front. The neon sign carries the newest in modernistic lettering. And for learners, which opened two years earlier, there was a very similar article with modernistic lines throughout. Beautifully fixtured, it offers a new style tendency in keeping with the city and the times. So you can see that Wichita was very interested in in um, embracing new technology, new techniques, new architecture. They wanted to be seen as modern and progressive in all ways. And again, great details you can see here in these two photographs of the, these chromium plated doors. You can see some mannequins through the window. And these were both shops for women. And this building was raised in 1948 to make way for the Woolworth store, which was then torn down in the 90s and is now the site of the Chester I. Lewis Reflection Park. This is a civic theater. This is one of Eric's favorite buildings. This was at 725 West Douglas. If you um, follow our Facebook page, I shared a photo of the Western Grill a few weeks ago, which was right next door to this theater. And you can see it's got a pretty magnificent facade there. It opened in 1936 
and this was taken shortly after it opened. Um, this building was demolished in 1977. And the owner of this uh, theater also owned the Crest and a number of other theaters in Wichita, O.A. Sullivan. This is the Goodrich Silvertown Filling Station. It was at 149 North St. Francis. More of an art modern style than a, than a true art deco, but really very interesting. And what's also great about this photograph is you can see on the left is the Eaton Hotel, which was, of course, constructed in the late 1880s and very much a Victorian style. Um, and then at the center, you can see the Alice Hotel kind of peeking up over the top, which was by uh, all accounts, an, an Art Deco um, constructed architectural style building. So two kind of two flanking ideas here, the Victorian and then the new Art Deco, and then this Art Modern style here with the filling station. And that, of course, is no longer there. Speaking of the Alice Hotel, here's a photograph of the Alice. It opened on uh, in 1930. It was at 204 South Broadway. It was um, right next door to the Henry or right across the street from the Henry store um, to the south. And then to the west was the Innes Department store. So, a, you know, a great part of downtown Wichita. It was designed by Schmidt, Boker and Overend. Um, it was shuttered in the 1970s and preservationists lobbied for decades to save this building but unfortunately it was demolished in 1976. And here's one that's probably unfamiliar to you because it was never built. Uh, this is an architect's rendering of the new Roosevelt Hotel. It was to be at Douglas and Waco um, in 1929, a group of Kansas businessmen planned a grand hotel for Wichita at a cost of $1.2 million. They broke the ground, um, they poured some footings, but in the end they just could not, they could not finance this project. Because remember, this is shortly after the stock market crash and we were, you know, inching our way towards the Great Depression. So it was never built, but at least we have this terrific architectural rendering to show what might have been um, but yeah it's pretty pretty fabulous and you can see there's airplanes in the sky and and lots of people on the ground and wow that would have been something but a hotel that was constructed and and still stands is the Lawson Hotel it's not an art art deco style but I wanted to kind of contrast these two images the uh, Lawson opened in 1918 and this photograph on the left was taken in 1935 and they they manufactured these i think they were probably luggage tags but you can see that they're embracing that art deco graphic style for this for this image and they've really stylized the lines of the hotel and this great graphic um very striking so a way that you know an older building could still use those new um, modern graphic styles. Now we're going to talk a little bit about costume and you can see some probably behind me. This is a photograph of the Wolf, Wolf Brothers department store at 127 129 East Douglas. That building still stands as well. This is about 1923. We're seeing quite a shift if you compare even to styles 10 years prior to this but certainly if you look back to 20 or 30 years it's a marked shift so these dresses you can see they're fairly straight um, there's no definition of a waist there's no there's very little definition of a bust or of hips um, so embracing that flapper idea of a androgynous carefree young um, kind of irreverent woman who would um you know just be ready to to take on the 1920s um after world war one and you can see that illustrated here this is a photograph of the innes department store window and this was a it's made in wichita week so it's featuring products uh, produced by the mentholatum company which many of you are familiar with. And the woman, it's, it's a little difficult to see, but if you look at the woman and she's gazing at herself in the mirror and 
her face is beat. And by that, I mean she's wearing a lot of makeup. And her hair is very much in that flapper style. It's been bobbed. She's got some Marcel curls going on. She's wearing a feather boa. She's, it looks like she's wearing some kind of a gold or silver lame dress. So she, I think, is even uh, dipping her toe into vamp territory. And it's almost at cross purposes with the mentholatum company values. And that was a product that was for, you know, sunburn or if you had a cut or a scrape. And often their promotional materials featured a mother with children. It was a very wholesome company, um, very family oriented. The, the founder, A. Hyde, who's pictured here, there on the, on the lower part of the window, uh, was extremely religious, very philanthropic. Um, he would have been a rich man had he not given away all of his money to charity. But it's interesting to me to see that juxtaposition. And here's another illustration of mentholatum. They did a lot of promotions. And here we see a young woman um, in her swimming suit at the shore, and her color is from fresh air and sunshine. She's not wearing makeup. Um, she's got a little sunburn, but that can be taken care of with the mentholatum salve. And again, that idea that women are becoming more active, they're becoming more interested in sports, um, they're just they're becoming more emancipated as as the decades go on. This is a photo of Virginia Derby, and this is from her photo album, and she has marked this that she is Charlestoning. So she's doing the Charleston in her driveway, um, and she's adopted kind of that flapper haircut. She's wearing a shorter dress, and then she's doing what was a rage at the time, which was the Charleston. And here's another view of Virginia Derby. Here she's much more elegantly dressed. So we know she danced the Charleston. It appears here as maybe she was also a ballerina of sorts because she's wearing what looks like a tutu and some, some toe shoes. But just a very elegant, again, embracing that ideal of um, art deco fashion and, and just, just stunningly beautiful, I think, in this photograph. Here's a photograph, uh, and it's helpfully marked. It's the banquet in honor of B.H. Neely. He was the commander of the Arthur Gossett Post at the American Legion, and he was a World War I soldier who served in Paris. I'm sorry, not Paris. He served in France, but it was not in Paris. Um, but he was invited in 1927 to attend the Paris Convention, which was quite an honor. And so they, the American Legion held this banquet for him at the New Hope Baptist Church. This is a great photograph. You can see all the different styles worn by um, a, a variety of people, and it's interesting, to, uh, you know, from a from a costume historian's perspective, to see the various styles that were worn by by young and old. And this photograph is also important because we actually have very little that represents the black community, so it makes it all the more important that we have this really wonderful image. This is the Coleman Company basketball team. It was not uncommon for these companies to have sports teams. Um, and you, I have talked a little bit about the Marcel hair. Here you see that virtually to every woman, their hair has been Marcel except for the one in the center, but she at least has that bob haircut. Um, they're wearing bloomer style um, pants and then kind of a sailor style top for the you know activity on the court. And then I think probably female coach there is to the right and she is wearing the eyeglasses that are so iconic to that time worn by men and women just around kind of a tortoise shell frame and <clears throat> here's a view of the wheeler kelly hagney trust company bowling team again they're all wearing a very similar hairstyle i don't know if bowling was a more um uh was a sport that you dressed up more for i don't know but their costumes seem to be a little bit um, more formal than perhaps basketball. And this is from 1929. This photograph shows some young women who worked at the Peerless Laundry Company. So they worked in a laundry and they're wearing their work dresses, which are very simple. Um, what's of interest to me in this photograph is that especially the young woman who is at the left of the photo, she's tried to 
give this a little bit of fashion. She's put a belt around her dress. She's carrying a very uh, 1920s style, 1930s style um, purse. There's another young woman who's carrying the same kind of purse, but still, you know, they're working in this um, very grueling environment. They're wearing their, you know, they all have their bobbed haircuts, and yet they're still trying to be fashionable, which I think is is what a lot of people have done um, throughout time. You you always want to look your very best, even if you're wearing a work dress. This is a view of the domestic laundry. This is about, you know, a decade earlier, but you see it's the same kind of work uniform. And just to give you an idea of what the working conditions were like in these, in these laundries, which were very common um, throughout the United States until they introduced um, modern washing machines. This is Miss Wichita of 1928. It's Gladys Martin. She was the beauty contest winner. She's wearing a very fashionable, it's a cloth coat with a fur collar, cloche hat. So when you've got your bobbed hair, you can, you know, you don't have to worry about mashing your curls because it's so sleek to the head. She was also Princess Wichita in 1924. And this was a National Air Congress, which was an aviation um, event, beauty pageant winner. Here she is on the left wearing pilot's tog. She was not a pilot. There were uh, female pilots in Wichita at the time. She was not one, but she is, you know, in the um, costume of a pilot. And then on the right, a photograph of her with, again, this Marcel hair, which was so popular. Um, this was a newspaper article from 1924. Dorothy McBride, I don't know much about this woman, except that we have these photographs in the collection. And she looks like the iconic flapper girl in these photographs when she's wearing a drop waist silk chiffon beaded dress with a lot of makeup and then um, on the right she's wearing again that very popular coat with a fur collar cloche hat she's got that cupid bow lip very much like clara bow or even betty boop so just an iconic view of that time where were women getting these hairstyles? Where were they having their marcelled hair done? Well, you could do it at home. They did have Marcel curling irons. It would be very laborious. But many women went to beauty shops, and Lawson Hotel had a nice beauty shop. This is a view from 1936. You can see there's a very bored operator uh, to the right. She's reflected in the mirror. And then in the back, and we'll show a close-up view, you see the Marcel device both not in use and in use. And I think this is the kind of thing that every museum has in their collection because they look so unusual. Um, and this was invented by a woman in Chicago. And there's a very interesting story about her. Her name is Marjorie Stewart Joyner. And if you want to Google her, um, the patent details are very interesting. And the way she developed this um, concept is quite interesting. I won't read you all that I have, but if you want to research that on your own, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I don't want anyone to think that we're leaving out the children. So this is a view of Carleton School from 1936. You can see that the, the, the especially the young girls have those very, um, very 30s inspired haircuts. Um, little pixie cuts and then the teacher at the back is wearing kind of a diagonal um, cut dress with with the buttons on the diagonal so a kind of you know kind of a nod to art deco and of course the marcel hair men people often ask why don't we include men in some of these exhibitions when we're doing costume and clothing and it's because men's clothes for the most part just they don't change very much you could take these men and put them into present day and they would look just as stylish as they do in this photograph. Of course, they, they all have hats, so that's been a bit of a change. Um, but, but in so many ways, men's clothes just don't change. I know there are costume historians that have built careers on proving that wrong, but um, in my mind, they're just, they just are not as dramatic in the way that the styles change. Oh, and B.H. Neely, who we talked about earlier, he is in this photograph. He's on the front row, second from the right. When you think about flappers, 
two women often come to mind. One is Josephine Baker, who has nothing to do with the Wichita. And the second is the woman pictured here, who, when we quizzed the staff, half of them had no idea who this woman was. So I hope you will recognize her and know that this is famous Louise Brooks. And she was not born in Wichita. She was born in Cherryvale, but she moved to Wichita as a young girl. And she was a very famous dancer and actress. She appeared in this newspaper article from 1925. And this is her classic haircut. She had this hairstyle from the time she was in junior high. This is from 1925. And she was performing with Charlie Chaplin. And then this photograph from 1936, she had developed a, um, a business arrangement with Milgram Dress Company, and they named a dress after her. And so she's modeling this dress in, in 1926. And the museum's open today. I selected this photograph to end my program because it dates from July 13th, 1931. And the banner across the marquee says this theater open today. And why would it say that? Well, at the time there were blue laws and on Sundays you could not do anything that was, let's see, Kansas law prohibited all labor on Sunday except labor of necessity. So anything like going to the movie, going to an amusement park, those were things that were considered against the law. But the Kansas theater bucked that trend and thought they were going to be open on Sunday and actually they were charged with a crime and it was in the courts for about 16 months before the charges were dropped. But I think that is um, a very interesting story. And again, you can see the Art Deco attired women. There's a woman here who's picking up her ticket from the window and you can see the shop next door with the Art Deco facade. And again, just a great view of what Wichita was like in the 20s and 30s. So that's it for me. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of these places and some of these clothes. We're doing a tour right after this presentation of the Art Deco exhibit. And so I encourage you to join us if you can. If you can't, um, the museum is open Tuesday through Friday, 11 to 4. Saturday and Sunday, 1 to 5. We're free on Sunday. So I hope you will come and see this exhibit and all the other great things we have at the Historic Museum. Thank you.